What's up YouTube? This is True Off the TV. Alright, so in this video I want to uh, thank Aram for his suggestion that I update my top 10 list by position as far as NBA players in NBA history. In essence, my top 50 all-time list but by position. And um, you know, I was looking at those videos, and it, it had been a long time since I've done those videos, like six going on seven years ago. So I do believe it's time that I make some some updates, you know what I'm saying? Um, let me say this. Everybody's not going to agree with my list. That's just how it is, okay? I'm not going to agree with everybody that I have placed in this place or that place, all right? Um, I want to give some honorable mention, all right? Even though he didn't make my cut, Chris Paul could be on anybody's top 10 list, all right? Um, another guy who was in my top 10, but I have since taken him out is uh, Nate Tiny Archibald, okay? Um, at the end of the day, I had to make room for one guy. I had to take somebody out. It was him. You know what I'm saying? But there are a lot of great point guards that, you know what I'm saying, you could make an argument could be on this list. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, I had to be honest with myself and say who I thought should be in this list. And at number 10, I have Steve Nash, which each of these videos, I'm going to have a quote attributed either to that player or about that player. And this sums up Steve Nash per per perfectly, in my opinion. And that is, uh, he once said, if every basketball player worked as hard as I did, I'd be out of a job. And I think that's perfect about Steve Nash because... Steve Nash wasn't the biggest, he wasn't the fastest, he wasn't the, the quickest, the strongest, or, or the most skilled guy, uh, but he worked very, very hard on his game to not only make it to the NBA, but to be a star in the NBA, and that there were players who were more physically gifted and were actually, you know, I guess what you would say, better players than Steve Nash. But they only worked as half as hard or a third as hard, and they never maximized their abilities. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I remember also reading a quote from Steve Nash saying that the best players that he's observed are guys that are always adding something to their game. So this is a guy that always tried to get better every year. So from the work ethic standpoint, I have nothing but respect for Steve Nash. I just wish that he could play defense. Nah, but um, Steve Nash was the floor general of one of the original premier small ball lineups. The 2000 Phoenix Suns with the vaunted seven seconds or less offense. They had a lineup that featured Steve Nash, of course. Uh, they had uh, Quentin Richardson on their team, uh, Sean Marion. Initially, Amari Stoudemire, Amari Stoudemire, but he began to have injury issues. Uh, I remember Jimmy Jackson being on those teams at least one year, maybe two. Uh, Leandro Barbosa, who was always pegged as the fastest player in the league. Um, you know, they had a pretty good squad, man, you know what I'm saying? Um, and they could score, and they usually were right at, you know what I'm saying, number one in scoring in the NBA, either points per game or offensive efficiency. Uh, but the, the problem was is that with almost any D'Antoni team, defensively, they were porous. And their kryptonite, every playoff, 
you've seen with the San Antonio Spurs, you know. But Steve Nash, you know what I'm saying, was a great basketball player. Steve Nash, even though most of us think of him as a Canadian, he was actually born, I believe, in South Africa in 1974. But when he was a, a baby, uh, you know, not quite two years old, his family moved to Canada. And as a child, Steve Nash enjoyed sports, hockey, but it was basketball where he excelled. All right. And after having a very sensational uh, high school basketball career, Steve Nash earned a scholarship to Santa Clara University, where he starred for many, many years. Very successful at Santa Clara University. And based upon this dominance there, Steve Nash was the 15th overall pick in the heavily uh, touted 1996 NBA draft. Many people would say that was the best draft in NBA history. And, you know, he went to the rebuilding, at the time, Phoenix Suns. This is after Charles Barkley was traded from Phoenix to Houston. And you would think with a rebuilding club that this is the perfect time for a young and hungry point guard to make his mark and, you know, go on to NBA success. But it wasn't to be because... The Phoenix Suns were already loaded with guard at that time. Um, they were playing, let me see, I believe they had at that time, they still had Kevin Johnson, who was injury prone and had several injuries, but they still had Kevin Johnson on the roster. Later on, they would acquire Jason Kidd, who was the young premier point guard at that time. So you already have Jason Kidd, you already have Kevin Johnson, and if I remember correctly, the Suns had a small ball lineup themselves where Antonio McDyche was the center. And I'm trying to remember the players that, that, was, that were on those teams. I remember Rex Chapman being on that team. And they had another guard on that team. I just can't remember who, but I thought I remember them having a three-guard lineup, you know what I'm saying, but really just guards on the floor, and a guard masquerading as a small forward, a small forward, so they already had a lot of guards, so Steve Nash, there really wasn't a lot of minutes for him there, so ultimately he was traded in 1998 to the Dallas Mavericks, there, you know what I'm saying, he was able to flourish. And it was there where Steve Nash became an all-star. And on that team, Dirk Nowitzki, who also had a rocky start to his career, but ultimately, you know, persevered and became a, a, an all-star, if not superstar with the Dallas Mavericks. And he also was reunited with Michael Finley. That's who it was, Michael Finley. I think Michael Finley was, was the guard on those Phoenix Suns teams, but ultimately he ended up going to Dallas as well. But he was reunited with Michael Finley with the Dallas Mavericks. And um, those were some really good teams in the early 2000s when Steve Nash was playing with the Dallas Mavericks. Um, ultimately, I remember they were knocked out of the playoffs by the San Antonio Spurs in 2003. Um, I can't remember what round that was. I'm saying, let me see what round that was. Let me look it up right quick. It was the Western Conference Final. Yeah, it was the Western Conference Final. When they, they made it all the way to the Western Conference Final, but they lost to the eventual champion, San Antonio Spurs, four games to two. And uh, after the 2003 2004 season, Nash became a free agent, and um, 
he wanted to resign with the Mavericks, but Mark Cuban was a little bit leery about signing a long-time deal with a 30-year-old point guard. So ultimately, he went back to his old team, the Phoenix Suns. And it's there with, you know what I'm saying, with Mike D'Antoni and the Phoenix Suns that magic was created. You know what I'm saying? Like, they had a very exciting team. I mentioned uh, Sean Murray himself, Amar Stoudemire, um, Leandro Barbosa, Quentin Richardson, um, Joe Johnson, too. Uh, yeah, that's right. I see it now. Uh, Joe Johnson later on, of course, the star Atlanta Hawks. Uh, Joe Johnson started in the NBA with the Boston Celtics, I think, for a year, but he was traded to Phoenix. But, um... It was around this time that I think Steve Nash benefited from some stuff, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, he benefited from the fact that the league was in a dark place at that time. No pun intended. Um, the league had just suffered a black eye with the malice at the palace situation. And um, a lot of people were sort of... You know, you look at the teams that were the best teams in the league at that time, right? And you had the Detroit Pistons, you had the Pacers, and you had the Spurs. Now, the Spurs are a little bit different. They were <coughs> a great defensive team, but, you know, the, the Pacers and, and the um, Pistons, they, they could be physical. You know what I'm saying? And... The league was trying to appeal to a broader audience. They wanted to clean the league up a little bit. They wanted the play to be friendlier, I guess. You know, not rugged, not physical. They were trying to get away from the physicality aspect. So they did away completely with hand checking. And they tried to open the game up. And this let a guy like Steve Nash you know, flourish. And, you know, you saw, like, in the next couple of years, a wave of perimeter players who, prior to that, you know what I'm saying, were not necessarily lighting it up. Now, all of a sudden, they were dropping 25 points a game, 29 points a game, 30 points a game. You know what I'm saying? Guys who were only averaging 20 points a couple of years before, now they're averaging 28, 29 points a game. Now, Steve Nash wasn't a scorer per se, but he was one hell of a shooter. And, uh, you know, he quickly became not only the best passer in the NBA, supplanting John Stockton and Jason Kidd in that role, um, he also became the best shooter, which is something Jason Kidd was never known for. Um, as a matter of fact, I think Steve Nash has the most seasons with 50-40-90, if I'm not mistaken. I think he had four individual seasons shooting 50-40-90. And um, Steve Nash won two league MVPs. Now, me personally, even though you can argue politics was involved in both of them, I don't have a real issue with him winning it in 2004-2005. I know the realities. I know why. 2005, 2006, I thought that there were better candidates for it. I thought you could make an argument that Tim Duncan should have won the MVP again in 2006. You could argue that Dirk Nowitzki should have won it in 2006. You can make the argument that LeBron James should have won it that year. Um, I think that they should have went to Kobe Bryant. But they went to Steve Nash. Whatever. Um. In the first round of that year, the Suns played the Lakers. And the Lakers really had no business even being like competitive in that series. If you look at Kobe Bryant's roster, the roster around him, you know, they shouldn't even have been in the playoffs, to be honest with you. But, you know what I'm saying, they took advantage of certain things. Amari Stoudemire 
who was the all-star center at the time for the Phoenix Suns, was injured. Uh, he, had, I think, had just had that microfracture surgery that year. And after playing a couple games that year, he was shut down for the rest of the season. He was not available for the playoffs. So, even though the Suns were explosive, they had some weaknesses. They were a little, they were defensively porous on the perimeter, and um, they were smallish. So the Lakers kind of took advantage of this of, of the size of the Suns. Kobe is Kobe, you know what I'm saying. And at the end of the day, after they dropped the first game. The Lakers would win the three next games and go up three games of one. Game four being a Kobe Bryant buzzer beater in overtime. But Phoenix would go on to win the next three games. And um, they would go on to win that series. And they would go on to beat the Clippers in the semifinal. But they lost in the conference finals to the Dallas Mavericks, his former team. The next year, Steve Nash had probably his best statistical campaign. He averaged 18.6 points and 11.6 assists to become the first point guard, the first person since Magic Johnson in 91 to average 18 points and 11 assists per game during the regular season, all right? He came just that shy from winning his third consecutive league MVP, ultimately narrowly going to Dirk Nowitzki. You know what I'm saying? In 2007, the playoffs, the Suns beat the Lakers in five games before losing four games to two to the Spurs in the conference semifinal. Now, after this, you can make the argument that the Suns' window of opportunity for championships had, had pretty much started closing. Although they still were a top team, but, you know, other teams were kind of rising in the West. The, the Spurs were still there. <coughs> you know, they always had, like, little reshuffling in the, in the and the lineup of the Spurs was still there with Ginobili and Parker. The Lakers became a championship team. Denver had their little run. Uh, Dallas was quickly usurping the Suns as a power. And so afterwards, you know, the Suns were still a really good team, but people didn't really see them as a championship team. And they, they were making the same arguments that they make today about Houston. They can score, and they're really good in regular season, but in the playoffs, they can't do shit. Like D'Antoni. You know what I'm saying? So ultimately, what happened is, um, I believe Mike D'Antoni was let go. He was replaced by Terry Porter. But then later on, I think he was an interim coach. He was permanently replaced, permanently replaced by Alvin Gentry. They made an attempt to become more defensive-minded. Um, they acquired Jason Richardson. Um, ultimately, that proved to be a bad thing with Steve Nash. You remember that incident? You know, exactly what happened with Jason Richardson and Steve Nash's wife or girlfriend, whatever. Uh, to me, whatever, man. Both of them, Jason Richardson and that woman are trash. Um, they acquired Shaquille O'Neal. But it didn't work, you know. Plus, you can argue by 2011, 2012, Steve Nash was starting to finally show his age, which was the mid going into his late 30s at that particular time. Um, you know, so 2012, Steve Nash passed Oscar Robinson for career assists during that particular season. But the Suns were declining and diminishing as a team. In 2012, they missed the playoffs for the second consecutive year. And his run with the Suns was over. In 2012, the Lakers acquired Nash in a signed trade deal with Phoenix. 
And um, it just didn't work out with Steve Nash in, in L.A., all right? He was reunited with his former coach, Dan Tony, But Steve Nash was, by this time, a shell of himself who was dealing with uh, serious physical illnesses um, and ailments. Um, issues with his back, issues with nerve pain. Uh, sciatica, something that I I deal with. I know how terrible that can be. Um, so he missed a lot of games. And um, at the end of the day, you know, it just didn't work out. You know. So, you know, it just wasn't to be. You know, he went there to try to form a super team. I think it was him, Kobe, I believe Dwight Howard was there, but it didn't work out. You know, Dwight Howard's a pussy. Um, Steve Nash, he's not, but, you know, he was at the end of his rope. Um, they tried to, you know, do certain things. Dan Tony, a lot of people get on Dan Tony because you can make an argument that Mike Dan Tony ran Kobe into the ground every year because Kobe had to not only score, but they they pretty much had Kobe running the offense at that time. That's what killed when people say all oh, Kobe did was shoot. When he was playing with Mike D'Antoni, Kobe was kind of doing what, you know what I'm saying, James Harden is doing. He was scoring plus being the, basically the point guard. They had Nash playing off guard, spot and shoot, but it, it just didn't work. You know what I'm saying? Um, the difference is, you know, guys like Kobe, they don't pad their numbers. They didn't pad their stats and shit. You know, but ultimately, Kobe Bryant ruptured his Achilles. They did make it to the playoffs that year, but, you know, that was pretty much it, man. You know, Steve Nash would persevere for a couple more years, but he had announced before the 2014-15 season that that would be his final season. And um, he retired on March 21st, 2015. He retired as a Laker. Um, the Cavaliers actually had uh, asked Steve Nash if he was interested in being a backup for Kyrie Irving for the 2015-16 season. It's interesting because if he had said yes, maybe he would have won a ring, being the Cleveland won a ring in 2016. Um, later on, the Dallas Mavericks offered, you know, Steve Nash a, a, you know, a reduced role on their team, but he declined because he knew physically he was done. Um, after his playing career was over, Steve Nash uh, became a consultant with the Golden State Warriors. And um, his first year as a consultant with the Warriors was the year that the Warriors went 73-9. and nine. Um, <clears throat> The next year, 2017, uh, the Nation Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame had shrank their window from five years to three years as far as eligibility for players. So Steve Nash was inducted to the Hall of Fame two years ago on September the 7th, 2018, along with uh, Jason Kidd and Grant Hill. And former players Ray Allen, Maurice Cheeks, and Charlie Scott. And earlier this month, of course, Steve Nash was announced as the head coach of the Brooklyn Nets, and I'm very sure uh, that he will uh, lead that team as a head coach to success, and maybe he'll be a better version of Steve Kerr in the Eastern Conference, as coaching is concerned. Uh, but <clears throat> Steve Nash played a total of 19 seasons in the NBA. He had two different stints with the Phoenix Suns. He stint with the Dallas Mavericks, and of course with the Lakers for three years. He was a two-time league MVP, eight-time NBA All-Star, 
three-time All-NBA first team, two-time All-NBA second team, uh, twice he's on the All-NBA third team, five different seasons, Steve Nash led the NBA in assists with 2010-2011 uh, being the final season that he led the league in assists. That's why I had to correct. Um, that's what it was, guys. That's why I had to correct Chris Broussard. Because Chris Broussard one time said in a, um, on a segment that LeBron James was the oldest man ever to lead the NBA in assists. And that's not true. Steve Nash led the NBA in assists in 2011 when he was 37 years old. You know what I'm saying? And then, like, the next day or two days later, you know, he had to kind of clarify that shit. I know y'all be looking at our channels. Four times, <clears throat> Steve Nash had a season of 50, 40, and 90. He did it in 2005, 2006. And three years in a row, 2007, uh, 2008 season, and the t into the 2009, 2010 season. In 2007, he won the J. Walter Kennedy Citizenship Award. Twice, he was the FIBA America Cup MVP. He won the Lou Marsh Trophy in 2005. All right. His number 11 was retired by the Santa Clara Broncos. Twice, he was the WCC Player of the Year, 95 and 96. And for his career, he averaged 14.3 points, to go along with three rebounds and 8.5 assists. And as a consultant, not as a player, but as a consultant, he was a two-time NBA champion with the Warriors in 2017 and 2018. And of course, he is a Hall of Famer. And I want to check out his numbers right now. Quick. Um, let's see something. My the thing I liked about Steve Nash, man, <clears throat> is that he was a great all around shooter. You know what I'm saying? He was a great playmaker, ball, you know, really good ball handler, but he was a great shooter. Like, not just three. Like, he took threes, but he didn't live behind the three-point line. You know what I'm saying? He had a great mid-range. Like, he was, like, he, like, I, that's why I know in today's NBA, he would kill it. Because not only is he a great outside shooter, but he's a great shooter. And you could see the effect and, and, and the influence of a guy like Steve Nash on a guy like Kevin Durant. You know what I'm saying? They're both great overall shooters. And it, it, when, you, when you think about it, it makes sense that Steve Nash is the coach of the Nets. Because both Kyrie Irving and uh, both Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant both apparently that they really like this guy. You know what I'm saying? But you look at this guy. He shot 49% from the floor. He shot 42.8% from three-point range, which is just shy of Steph Curry and better than Klay Thompson. 90.4% from the floor. Look at this. He shot 56% for his career in effective field goal. And 52% from the two. We're talking about a point guard that mostly shot from the perimeter. When you look at his career totals, he played in 1,217 games. He had 17,000 career points. He had over 10,000 career assists. I believe he had one assist more than... Uh, Mark Jackson. So, this is my number 10 guy, man. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Steve Nash. I know he has his detractors as far as his defense is concerned, but there was a stretch where this guy was, you know, along with Jason Kidd, 
he was the premier point guard in the NBA. You know what I'm saying? One of the premier point guards in the NBA. Um, you know what I'm saying? And, yeah, you got to give it to him, man. Steve Nash, number 10.